the high desert in the great American Southwest. I bid you good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world's 25 beautiful time zones, each and every one covered like a blanket by this program, Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell. Thank you for being here. Um, There are some, you know, some days in your life you live long enough where uh, you, you get to see things or walk in on things uh, on TV and they just stop you cold, right? For me, I remember walking in uh, as Challenger launched in the accident. That stopped me cold. And uh, so did, uh, of course, 9-11. And now, uh, today, Paris. I walked in, uh, and the TV was nothing but Paris. It had just begun, and I've seen all the coverage. So we're going to talk about it uh, in this first hour. In the second hour, we're going to go to open lines, and you can talk about that or anything else. But it's pretty darn big news. Two rules for this program, no bad language, one call per show. Here's what I know about Paris. It's not much. Six sites were attacked in the city of Paris. They believe 153 people or more may be dead, reported dead. It was a terrorist attack. France has declared, get this now, a state of emergency, and France has closed its borders. Very unusual move. Uh, The citizens of Paris are asked to stay at home tomorrow. There are thought to be five attackers dead thus far. There were three wearing varying uh, kinds of explosives like belts. Uh, Gunmen are thought to perhaps still be loose, unknown how many. You have to wonder where the next major city is, perhaps New York. ISIS is celebrating, but not yet claiming official credit for doing this. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. It could be there are more attacks to unfold there or elsewhere. One attacker was quoted by somebody who was there uh, as speaking in French that this attack is related to Syria and Iraq, and then he was heard to scream Allah Akbar. I have one uh, complaint, I guess you could call it. Um, The French police did not move in on the theater soon enough. Um, If they had understood who these people were, they would have moved in right away because they were in there killing him one at a time. And it's probably ISIS, that's my opinion. But whoever it turns out to be, they had only one motive, and that was to kill people to commit a terrorist act, act as many as possible. So that theater should have been rushed immediately, in my opinion. Otherwise, the French look like they're doing a good job. Coming up, Richard S. Hahn is president of R. Hahn and Company, Inc. They are a security consulting and investigative company specializing in counterterrorism and homeland security. All at stake here, right? Rick also works as an instructor and a lecturer for various U.S. government agencies, including the U.S. Department of State, Rick retired from the FBI after a distinguished career spanning 32 years. As an agent, he specialized in investigations of domestic and international terrorist organizations dating to the first terrorist activities in this country. And so here he is. Uh, welcome aboard, uh, Rick. Good evening, Art. Yeah, good evening. Um, it's pleasure to be here. It's good to have you. You're here in the first half hour, then we've got John Batchelor from New York on, which uh, I would imagine New York is somewhat on its uh, its toes tonight, uh, wouldn't you? I'm sure all of our major cities are at this point. Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that uh, all of the intelligence community is acutely aware of is the fact that there are sleeper cells probably in throughout the world. Uh that can be activated to do these types of uh, terrorist attacks at mm-hmm. almost any time on short notice. 
Um, all right. There is a theory that you might want to comment on, and that is that we uh, apparently turn Jihadi John into little pieces with a with a strike. What was it? Twenty four hours ago, if uh, if whoever did this had a cell ready in Paris, uh, do you think it could be a reaction to that? Oh, there's no question that that's certainly one of the uh, more probable uh, motives. But at this point, the fact that, as you point out, that uh, ISIS has not claimed credit for this, uh, you know, leaves us wondering at this point, speculating as to what group this could be. I mean, um, well, I think they were quoted on Twitter as saying, "Be patient." Now, that might indicate that they're going to take credit, but. Uh, there's still something going on, or they don't want to expose operatives, or who knows. Well, exactly. And at this point, uh, they, there could be um, outstanding orders for them to attack other cities, either in Europe or the United States or Australia, for that matter, right. or Canada. Um, and and they may be just waiting to see how opportune those uh, those situations are in those various countries. Uh, again, as you as you stated, the uh, city of New York is on alert, and I'm sure Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington D.C., mm-hmm. San Francisco are all also on on alert at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, if you had to hazard a guess uh, as to who did this, who would it be? Well, ISIS, of course, is is probably number one on the list, uh, only because of the bo- motivation factor with Jihadi John now, uh, as you said, in pieces. But that doesn't eliminate Al-Qaeda. It doesn't eliminate uh, Lashkari Taiba, which is the organization that pulled off the attacks in Mumbai. And I would point out that in Mumbai we had ten attackers that also attacked six separate targets, uh, very similar targets in that they're upscale restaurants, hotels, things like that. My people are actually comparing this to Mumbai. Um, and I suppose in the method of attack it's a reasonable comparison, right? Absolutely. And and it, it's a demonstration of the fact that it doesn't take a lot. Uh, a, a few weapons uh, and a small amount of explosives can cause a great deal of havoc. And because these are terrorists, these are not military personnel that wear uniforms that are distinguishable from the rest of the crowd, it makes it almost impossible for security services, be it police or military, to identify, locate, and neutralize these people. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I, I don't know how you're going to take this, but so, take it the way you will. Uh, it seems to me that this is blowback. And uh, when I say blowback, I don't mean just for Jihadi John. I mean blowback that goes back all the way to uh, the U.S. deciding that it was going to nation build in Iraq and all it did was nation destroy, and then, of course, it became a giant civil war and complete chaos, and that spread into Syria even more. And uh, the end result was the caliphate that we're going to have to end up eliminating uh, before this is all over. What do you think? Uh, well, I, I think you're, you're certainly in part right that we, we opened the door, we opened Pandora's box uh, by going into Iraq. There, there's no question about that. What... We failed to recognize, I think, back at the time in 2001, 2002, was the uh, the conflict that goes on within uh, Islam between the Shia and the Sunni organization. Mm-hmm. And uh, at this point, we're kind of caught in the middle. We're we're ending up more or less supporting uh, Shia organizations against uh, terrorists like ISIS. Mm-hmm. in Syria and in Iraq at this point, which is, you know, not exactly where we, anyone would have thought we have been 10 years ago. No. Uh, Syria is the biggest mess of all, of course. Uh, you, you've got uh, the president of Syria still sort of barely there, um, Assad, and uh, and then you've got the rebels uh, uh, trying to take him out, and the Russians trying to take out the rebels. Then you've got ISIS, and we're bombing ISIS, and upset that the Russians are trying to help us to death by hitting the wrong people. 
It's a, I mean, it, you know, you've got American and Russian airplanes, jets in the air, and now uh, boots on the ground. That seems like a mixture for World War III to me. It, it, it is very much that uh, politics makes strange bedfellows sort of thing. Uh, again, the, the fact of the matter is, is that al-Qaeda and ISIS are both Sunni organizations. Uh, and on the other hand, the people who over the past three decades have treated the Americans worst have been the Shia, starting with Iran, of course, and now we're basically defending the uh, Shia populations, and, and we've installed a Shia government basically in, in, Iran, uh, in Iraq. Well, I don't always uh, trust news that I read, uh, Rick, and I'm sure you don't either. Uh, the plane that was uh, taken down, that was sort of blamed on uh, ISIS. Uh, in fact, they took credit for it. And I, I'm, I still, they, they're not absolutely sure that it was ISIS or even that it was a bomb. And, and here in the West, we seem to want to pin it on them really hard, probably hoping to get the Russians to, uh, retarget, uh, in, in Syria. What do you think? Uh, certainly the Russians, uh, have some reason to, uh, suspect that this is probably ISIS striking at them because they've clearly have struck at ISIS in mm. well. Syria. So, uh, and, and there, again, there's good reasons for this. In the geopolitics of things, Russia would very much like to have those Iranian oil fields. And Iran, of course, is backing Syria. And as a consequence, Russia is backing Syria and yeah. striking out against ISIS. All right. Uh, now, let's just move on uh, and back to Paris. Frankly, um, I'm going to move us uh, to New York now or any other U.S. city. And, um, yeah, we're on our toes this morning wondering if this is about to happen in an American city. If it doesn't happen now, how long will it be till something this awful occurs here, do you think? There's just no telling. There's no answer to that, Art. Uh, the fact of the matter is is that we all believe that there are sleeper cells here in the United States. Uh, their access to weapons, their access to explosives here is probably pretty much unlimited. So in terms of having the logistics to do this, having personnel on the ground that are trained to do this, uh, I think there's no question that those cells exist in the United States. Okay. Um, it seems to me that the ideology central to ISIS right now is to initiate, basically, Armageddon. Is that far off? I don't think that's uh, too far off. I mean, that obviously, the, the goal of the extremists is to uh, Islamify the entire world. And uh, that, that's where they would like to go, starting with establishing the cliffhate in the Middle East and right. Europe. So. so either convert or kill. Exactly, precisely. All right. So if you know that you've got a group like that uh, uh, that's going to say to you, convert or kill, well, uh, we're not going to convert. And so if kill is the only thing that's going to happen, and it sure looks like it's the only thing they did in Paris uh, tonight, so uh, what about uh, the idea of just absolutely eliminating them from the face of the earth, more or less. I mean, well, that's, that, that, that certainly is a, 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 perhaps a, uh, a speculative dream, but I don't think that that would ever be possible. It's, uh, you know, th this is a system of beliefs, and uh, it has recruited, successfully recruited, thousands of young people who perhaps did had, had no other future uh, in store for themselves. And they see themselves as, as uh, brave, heroic uh, warriors. Uh, and it gives meaning to them. And I just this is the sort of thing that terrorism does. It just it provides a, a, a reason for being for a lot of young and energetic people. I get that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, this is the sort of thing that you just can't stop. Not, it's cert certainly not by wiping them off the face of the earth, because they'll, they'll go into hiding, and they'll reemerge somewhere else. 
Well, if their sole um, drive in life is to kill and or bring upon uh, Armageddon, I think we ought to deliver it to them uh, as best we can. And uh, I don't know what other path. Uh, what other path would you see us follow? Well, uh, I, I think it has to be a two-pronged sort of thing. I think you're absolutely right that we have to go to complete war. But this is, again, this is a uh, terror organization that is amorphous, uh, trying to identify and recognize uh, specific individuals that may be movers and shakers in this organization gets to be pretty difficult when you get outside of their own uh, publication networks. And so you don't know uh, who's out there that, that may be fomenting this sort of thing. Well, um, you look, we we have a lot of drone strikes. We take out highly placed individuals within uh, ISIS, let's say. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, they just, it's like the head of a snake getting replaced. And so this is going to be, before it's over, it's going to be an all-out war of some sort, Rick. Um, I guess with France on our side now, huh? Well, I think France has always been on our side. Unfortunately, France has always been a very open society. Going back to the 1970s, you may recall that uh, organizations like uh, PLO were con committing assassinations in France. It's a very diverse and uh, ethnically diverse society there in France. And um, as a result, there's lots of opportunity for that sort of, again, international geopolitical combat to, to be carried out there. Yes, but isn't this ISIS now, wouldn't it be fair to compare it to a virus? Let's say it's a deadly virus, and the spread has begun much the way Ebola did in Africa. Now, Ebola we dealt with, and I think we have to deal with them in much the same way, or in much the same way as Ebola spread, so will this, and uh, it's only a question of what American city is uh, coming next. Uh, cer certainly it is something that's contagious. Uh, there's no question about that. And obviously they've recruited uh, the lone wolf terrorists. They've inspired young people to do things. Uh, but th on the other hand, America, the United States specifically, uh, cannot confront this alone. This has to be confronted everywhere that it exists, which means all of Europe. And, of course, the, with the, the refugee out, outflow from uh, Syria and Iraq at this point uh, has just been an opportunity for organizations like ISIS to infiltrate more and more believers and, and establish more and more uh, sleeper cells in Europe. So we really need to make sure that Germany, France, Belgium, et cetera, et cetera, get on board here and uh, cooperate with us. What do you think, um, a, you can take a shot at this if you want to, uh, has changed in American culture that allows for the successful uh, recruitment of these young people, even here in America, who go there and then come back here and they're part of a cell or whatever? What has changed in our culture uh, specifically what has changed is our methods of communication uh, the director of the FBI testified this summer about the fact of the matter that things like Twitter um, allow these organizations to be literally in the pocket of people who may be recruited uh, that didn't exist 10 years ago these days, uh, you, you start visiting various websites, you, you communicate with people on Twitter, and suddenly in your pocket there's constant reminders that, gee, you could, you, you know, you may be a bus driver in New Jersey, but you could be a jihadi, you could be a freedom fighter for the, the you know, the great Islamification of the world. And, uh, that's the sort of thing that I think has really influenced a lot of young people and, and not only recruited them to take terrorist actions, but recruited them to do other things to support organizations, including raising money and sending money on, on to the organizations. So basically your answer is social media. Um, yes, exactly. It, it, okay, that's a pretty good area to explore, social media. So 
Should we go to the Twitters of the world? Uh, there are now many of them like that, I suppose. And then there's even the dark net. I have no idea how we control that. That's probably where they're communicating. But, I mean, should we go to these? The, the Twitters allow real distribution uh, to the masses. And uh, so should they responsibly stop this? In your uh, now, that, now, we're, now we're getting into the area of... Uh, that, that Mr. Edward Snowden uh, obviously took umbrage to, and that is, you know, at what point does the government intrude into these sorts of communications? Um, at the moment, th- perhaps, that national security is threatened. Well, at, at that point, it may be too late. For example, if, if, for example, we did not have the infrastructure in the National Security Agency to... Uh, do the things that that were going on when Edward Snowden uh, outed the agency. Um, after the fact, you can't go back and recapture those messages if they haven't been archived in some way. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that's the, that's the other side of the coin. On the one hand, we all want to say, well, we're, we're sure that the government isn't somehow surveilling us 24/7. And on the other hand, something like this happens in in France. And, you know, France is a country the size of Texas, roughly. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the communications in and out of there, and I would suspect that much like Mumbai, that the actors, the terrorists that have been carrying out these actions in, in France, have been in communication with some sort of leadership or with one another. And that sort of thing, if, if we haven't been capturing it as it goes along in terms of that communication, then, then we're not going to be able to figure out exactly who these people are. I mean, they throw away their, their, you know, when they're done, they throw away their weapons, they throw away their explosives, they change clothes, and they're just somebody else walking around somewhere in France. Right. Uh, with a lot of gunpowder residue on them, at least. Well, again, well, if they change clothes, they're not going to have that problem either. Well, it gets on your hands and stuff. I Yeah, I know. Uh, so, if you had the power, I'm just curious, uh, and it'll tell me kind of where you are about this, but Rick, if you if you had the power uh, to order what would happen with respect to the West versus the problems in Syria and Iraq right now, what would you do? Well, there's two things. I would uh, take two, two uh, different prongs to this. Number one, I think that we need to sit down with someone like Assad. Or Assad himself. Really? And yes, oh, I think so. I think we need to sit down with Assad, and and with the his backers, which of course would be the Iranian government, and say, look, we you know we cannot let this continue to spread. We cannot let this continue to go on. Assad, of course, is at this point uh, believed to have used chemical weapons. I mean, this is a violation of international accords. Mm-hmm. So. But but we do need to go to him and say, this has to stop. And then the other thing we need to do is, again, have a coalition that goes to these various organizations. And if they are unwilling to speak with us and have some sort of armistice, then we just have to go completely to war with them. We sent over, I believe, 50 special forces guys here recently. Was that just the beginning of what's really to come? Oh, I think so. I, you know, the, if if we want to resolve this problem, again, it has to be a coalition of, of various governments that have an interest in this, including including the Russians, and and we have to send more than just advisors and trainers. I mean, the bottom line is we have to engage in war with those that are not willing to cooperate. Is this going to begin to occur before the next president is in place? You know, I don't have a lot of confidence that this administration has the temerity to engage in a new war. So I don't think so. Temerity is a kind word. Um, I would agree with you. Um, you know, uh, past administrations, God knows, made their own mistakes uh, getting getting us into Iraq in the first place. Uh, so, as you pointed out, um, Assad has used chemical weapons. 
No, he stepped right on over the line that uh, the president drew and stuck his tongue out at us. Uh, other hand, uh, we went into Iraq because of chemical weapons, and there weren't any. And right. so then we deconstructed a, com- a country. We didn't build a nation. We sort of deconstructed one and then walked away uh, totally. All troops out. Not not the first time we did that. We did the same thing in Afghanistan. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, yes, we're famous for it. Um, and the question is, uh, do we ever learn our lesson? Now, this president isn't doing much of anything about all this. Uh, if a Republican gets in, uh, in all likelihood, something really big is going to happen, and I guess it, it needs to, huh? Well, I don't think this is going to go away. Let's no. put it that way. Again, these these are these are ideals. The the world, unfortunately, the world economy does not offer a lot of hope for young people, particularly from the Middle East and some of these other countries, or Middle Eastern people living in Europe, for that matter. Mm-hmm. And and so the recruitment uh, ability of organizations like ISIS or Al Qaeda or you name it. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. The, the whole point is that those young people are frustrated, they're angry, uh, and they're easily motivated to do terrible things. Um, and, and in the belief that they're somehow participating in something romantic, something that's a, a grand cause, and something heroic. And uh, as long as that exists, that's not going to go away. Well, again, uh, without respect to a discussion about uh, uh, Mr. Snowden, uh, do you think that the Twitters of the world should be asked not to propagate this stuff? I don't know how you do that. I, you you know, ask. Well, you ask. Uh, if you're the president of the United States, I guess you just ask. But but you'd have to have you'd have to have an NSA like agency with you know vast computer resources to monitor the the Twitter accounts of virtually everyone and every terrorist organization every one of them use, uses some sort of tradecraft they don't say hey on September 11th we're going to run planes into the World Trade Center in That's New true. York City That's true. of course it's it's all in code and it's all in encrypted in some sort of coded language that's innocuous. And so, you know, how do you do that? The, the bottom line is, is that you can't. Well, I, I think Twitter could, for example, if they wanted to, Twitter could. They could actually stop messages from that part of the world if they wish to, I suppose. Or maybe I don't properly understand the nature of the Internet. Maybe they couldn't. Uh, but that is where, as you pointed out, a lot of the recruiting for this kind of thing is going on. And it's going on right now in Minnesota also. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is is that, again, because they'll use code words, how do you recognize what is or isn't potentially dangerous communication? Um, well, you can't. And uh, as I pointed out, they could use, if you're talking about the terrorists, they could use the dark net to communicate their wishes and commands, uh, but... I was just addressing what you pointed out, which was the ISIS public relations campaign that seems to be effective in luring our young people uh, to go do stupid things. All right. We're running out of time, uh, Rick, but, I, you, you know, it's been – I'm going to have you on again. It's been really, really good having you on. So I hope you will come back and do another program. I'd be happy to, Art. My pleasure. All right. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Subject Paris and the attacks there. I'm Art Bell. in the desert dozen screen calls we trust you but remember the nsa 
Well, you know. To call the show, please dial 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. On September 12th of 2001, that would be the day after the fall of the Twin Towers, WABCAM in New York City recruited John Batchelor to go on the air until Osama bin Laden was either killed or captured. John's been on ever since, and remains on, offering insightful commentary on the war on terrorism, politics, presidency, national and global economics, and defending our civilization. That, that's one you'd underline for tonight, right? His personal interest in American history and wars from revolutionary through today's long war has generated remarkable coverage of jihadism as it enters our Western vocabulary and uh, at uh, at high speeds, uh, our chests and our heads as well. Um, hello, uh, John. It's wonderful to have you back. Good evening, Art. It's a grim evening, but we're in a war and things go wrong. And today was a very bad day for the good guys. You know, I opened up with, you know, the main facts as we know them in, in Paris and a gentleman uh, who is in this business uh, from the U.S. government originally, uh, and we had a talk about it. Um, you're in New York, so what I'd love from you is how is New York uh, this morning, do you know? I mean, are, are they on edge? I don't know, Art. Um, the whole story has drifted away from New York City these last years. We're the number one target. We were in 1993, certainly 2001, the two strikes on the, on the towers. And we remain the number one target, uh, not for one of trying these last 15 years I've been broadcasting. Right. So I do believe that the enemy, and there are a number of groups, there's an alphabet soup of witchcraft out there. The enemy has a very small playbook, and it repeats and repeats and repeats. And New York City is page one, paragraph one, sentence one Always. of to be destroyed. Yes. Yeah. Um, of course, Paris was probably an easier reach, uh, considering the, the refugees uh, flooding out of uh, Syria and Iraq. And I, I, I hope that's true. I hope that's true, Art. We can't be certain. This was a complex attack. It was. And yes, and they hit a soft target, but. It was a target that was, it's in the middle, it's downtown Paris, it's the young people of Paris. And they hit it without French intelligence, knowing or anticipating or being prepared. Uh, we have very incomplete facts at this point, but the Deuxième Bureau, the French intelligence network, is first rate. We learn from them. They right. have skills we don't have. That's right. And that's what, to go back to your New York question, New York is a lot worse off now than it was 24 hours ago, knowing that the enemy just cracked a better and more sophisticated fortress than this one. <laughs> You're saying security is better in Paris than it is in New York. They have the skills. They have North Africa. The, the Arabic language is integrated into French life. The, the North Africans have been fighting for the French Empire for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Their families are intermarried. Their, their literary skills are, are, are entangled. The, the French language and the Arabic language flow back and forth, have for, well, we can reach back to Rome and, and the, in, the, in, the, in the commerce of the Mediterranean. We're a new bunch to this of maintaining the watchtowers. I don't want to get paranoid here. I just want to emphasize that Paris is very, very good. And what I heard in the course of the evening, because the attack, first word of it was about 4.50 p.m. East Coast time. Right. Uh, what I heard in the course of the evening from people I respect a lot, I've worked with for a lot of years, is that the French intelligence was asking this side of the Atlantic for anything we'd heard mm -hmm. because they didn't have identities, they didn't have patterns, they didn't have safe houses, they didn't have it, Art. Well, I, I keep noticing uh, that they say, after they talk about Paris, they say, but U.S. sources say they're not hearing any chatter about the U.S. And I thought, well, 
Yeah, but the French didn't hear any chatter about Paris either. So what does that mean? It means that the enemy is very good, and it's necessary to respect the adversary. This was a murder raid launched by young men who aimed to die. That was their intention, self-destruction and spectacular self-destruction in order to disrupt modernity, and they did it. Um, as I mentioned to my last guest, uh, John, it seems like the center of their ideology is to initiate Armageddon. Uh, that's what they want. They want Armageddon. And I have come to the view that we should deliver it to them as best we can. I agree with that. I agree reluctantly with that. However, the political class in this country is not their art, if it was ever there. I know. And the political class in the European Union is not there, if it ever was. Well, it may and be nudged a bit tonight. Oh. Angela Merkel is the leader of Europe's banks mm -hmm. and the leader of Europe's future. And Angela Merkel, her government, has ruled that they will accept one million refugees yeah, I know. fleeing Mesopotamia. Yep. That in itself has disrupted their ability to govern. What would you uh, imagine? Of, of, going of, to of be that, nasty. Yeah, of that million refugees that they're willing to accept, I wonder how many will be jihadists. Someone said to me, and I can't remember exactly where it was, that it isn't the jihadist in hand. It's the one in the future. Hmm. It's, the, it's the teenager alienated by a difficult culture with, with incomplete language and mm -hmm. his mom and dad alienated because they can't work, who's at the mosque and in the year 2022 or 2028 is recruited for a single mission. That's the worry. Well said. Uh, and we talked about that last half hour as well, and I asked my guests, and I'll ask you. They're uh, doing a lot of recruiting on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if we shouldn't uh, politely ask Twitter uh, and some other social media to stop propagating the damn stuff. I don't. I don't know. I mean, we can ask, but who are we? I mean, you, you, you and I. You and I. We observe politics. We don't plunge into partisanship. I know this art. We watch. I mean, everybody comes from somewhere, but you can watch without picking an end. And our political class is no longer speaking the language that would be required to follow through on what you just suggested. They're not <laughs> there, Art. We have, a, we have an administration now that is seeking every remedy to empty Guantanamo. Every remedy, because it believes that by making that gesture... The enemy will respect us, or will like us, or will learn to work with us. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, that's not going to work. Um, I made reference, and I will again, to Ebola. You remember Ebola in Africa recently? It hasn't gone away. No, no. Well, uh, we did go over there and pretty much get control of it. But uh, ISIS is kind of like Ebola in a sense. I mean, it spreads in much the same way. Uh, it, it gets in one area and multiplies like uh, like rabbits. And uh, if we don't do something to stop it, if we don't muster up the political cojones to go after them, well, then it's going to be like Ebola in a big city runaway. I don't want to use should. I don't want to do that, Art. I've watched this for 15 years now. I think we're beaten. Until and if oh. it gets much worse. Until it gets much worse. Oh. Much worse. We're trying to pick a bottom, and you know you can't do that. No, you can't. You know it when you're there, but you can't pick it. I'm and hesitant to use the word beaten. I think, we, I'm, I think we're lazy. We're in a contest, a, a recognizable contrast contest with the great powers right now. Yes. We're fighting on several spheres. We're, we're, we're contesting in the South China Sea against Beijing. Uh -huh. We're contesting in the Black Sea Basin and the Mediterranean Basin against Russia. Right. 
and Russia is moving very effectively to coax, to invite the great powers of Europe into the Russian camp, as Beijing is moving effectively to intimidate the powers of Asia into its camp. So we have that contest, and then we have this other contest uh, out of Mesopotamia. They're not savages. They're warrior class. Mm. They're a primitive warrior class we come from. We started there 3,000, 2,000 years ago. And they're making war on civilization. And I don't, at this time, measure that we have the authority, the money, the power, or the unanimity to go into Mesopotamia. And here's what has to happen. Not has to happen. Here's what would work. What would work is what we did and what the Russians did between 1942 and 1945. Massacre. That's what works. And we're not ready to do that. Oh, well, I wonder how much further down this road we have to go before we are ready. Um, I saw something on the Internet earlier that I thought was appropriate. Uh, It said, some cancers have to be treated with radiation. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> I don't want to go I don't I don't I don't want to use the metaphor of malady. I do not think the enemy is ill. Oh no no I no no. I, I wasn't the, suggesting the enemy is sophisticated. The was, enemy is John okay, John, I wasn't suggesting they were ill. I was suggesting treatment with radiation, not medical radiation. All right, all right. <laughs> um, I I'm I hesitate. I'm I'm taking this this attack on Paris as a major landmark. This is as big a success as the attack on New York in 2001. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't know. It's this not 9-11. It's a but raid into Paris's confidence in itself. It's Mumbai, for sure, plus. Um, and it's worrisome, and it's scary. And, God, we have to start doing something, John. I, we have to start... Look, look at the look at the political class, Art. I know. They're, 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 they, I've watched four Republican debates and one sort of Democratic debate. Me too. It doesn't come up. It didn't come up. It, it it's not there. All right. Let's examine uh, just for grins what's going on in Syria right now. I I love doing this because it is such a mix of near end of the world stuff. You've got Assad, right? Then mm-hmm. you've got the rebels trying to take out Assad. Uh, you've got Syria operating in uh, another big hunk of the country. Uh, I mean, ISIS uh, operating in another part of Syria. Uh, we're going after them. So we've got planes in the air bombing. The Russians have planes in the air bombing. They're mostly going after the rebels instead of ISIS. Maybe after the downing of their planes, some other stuff, they'll join us. Who knows? You've got Russians in America at wingtip to wingtip. And I... Uh, I see it as, you know, the beginning of the end of it all. It could be. We've entertained, uh, in the course of conversations, and you know I do this every night, so there's a lot of time to get to these things. We entertain that we're looking at a, a surrogate battlefield. Yes. A, a, proto, a, a, a proto-Great War. Proxy. Yes. Uh, and we, we think of 1936 Spain and how the powers uh, interfered, intervened, manipulated the... The, the outcome in Spain, training their own weapons to contest with each other. There, it's not a complete, it's not a good, it's not a complete fit, but it's not bad to describe what Russia and its ally, China, uh, China and its ally Iran, are doing in the Syrian and Iraqi and Yemeni battlefields. Mm. And it's not bad to argue the way we're manipulating and intervening with our surrogates in the same battlefield. Do the do the does and NATO and its contest with Russia in Eastern Europe is part of this mix. So it, that's why it's not a perfect fit for Spain. But we do see now the the uh, the symmetrical warfare units that we associate with the great powers practicing and practicing their ability to project power in a battlefield that it, that it contains these this warrior class that just raided Paris. There is no there is no easy example because it's like we're fighting in time and space and the enemy some of the enemy is fighting in the 21st century and some of the enemy is fighting in the 10th century. <laughs> and that means that I 
I do not see a remedy for this. Well, I do, actually. I do. There is one larger remedy. And that is? Which, is? which is to recognize that we're outside of it. To, to, to accept the fact that Russia is, Russia is the center of the world island of Eurasia, and that Russia and Europe can defend themselves, will defend themselves, and that our interference, our intervention is not welcome, and that we remain outside, and they'll call upon us. We're a sea power, not a land power in the world island. And so, remaining, uh, outside, so, remaining outside, that gives us some time to prepare. So, so you're somewhat, for the moment, isolationist? No, 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 no. Because isolationism is it's their problem, not ours. It's our problem. We're just not effective. We're not ready. We're, we're not ready. We're not. We're not. I'm measuring how we've performed these last. Let's let's date it from the fall of the Soviet state in '89. Mm. We're not effective. We're we're fighting half-heartedly, or we're coming up with That'll uh, you. with limited limited goals, and then we fail. Yep. And we think capitals and governments are important. They're not. This is a battle for modernity versus savagery, but at the same time, the, the capitals themselves, Russia, uh, Moscow, and Berlin, are cognizant of the fact that it's their land. It's their world island. I don't have an easy metaphor for this. I, I, I work on it all the time, and I'm describing something that we're not good at or haven't been. We're the savior nation, and nobody's asking us to save them. Well, maybe that's because they know we don't know how. Mm. I mean, we we have the power, obviously, uh, perhaps not the will to use it, though, and so what kind of power is that? Uh, Right now, politically, I, I think that we're in, you know, really big trouble. We have a president who's not acting like a president right now. And I, I hate to say that because I was a supporter of his, but in terms of foreign policy, he has been a disaster. He had a vision, and it was based on premises that didn't work out. I'm, I'm being diplomatic. And the next president, the 45th president, will come to office with premises that work out or don't. I want to be positive here. I'm being too dire. I want to be positive. There is, <laughs> there is, the, there is a way to talk about this. Okay, well, and, let's try this. Let's try this. Um, give me the name of anybody on either side of the aisle who might be president who would be best uh, fitted to handle this situation for us. Heroes rise. Heroes rise from catastrophe. And my thinking is we haven't met that catastrophe. It's not there. Are you running for really? office? <laughs> Give me a name of somebody running currently or not running who is fit or uh, the right person in your view to, to handle this. There's no one contesting for the presidency right now. No one. Well. Other that, 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 that I, that I admire, that I have confidence in for this contest. These are, Nobody. these are actors, these are actors in a stage drama ongoing. The state takes care of itself. All right. Can you stick around a few more minutes, please? Of course. This isn't a conversation you can just, you know, end like that. So uh, stand by. John Batchelor is my guest right now. He's got a lot to say about this. Initiate a dialogue sequence with Art Bell. Please coordinate your phalanges and call 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. My guest at the moment is John Batchelor. I was on John's show. That interview, by the way, is generally available on the web. Uh, I think you can find it quite easily. It was a lot of fun. And we're talking about what happened today in Paris, which was not a lot of fun. And uh, again, John, I'm I'm going to make a uh, my analogy is, I guess, best made with uh, 
medicine, and, and that would be Ebola. I mean, where Ebola begins, it spreads rapidly. It's almost impossible to stop. Uh, but every now and then somebody gets on an airplane and spreads it to some other country. And uh, if we had not gone in there and cleaned it up, uh, it would still be spreading. And it, it just seems like that. It seems like ISIS is an organism, a virus that needs to be dealt with very quickly. It's an idea. And the idea is to conquer the earth, to make it a global caliphate, either submit or die. Yeah. That's the idea. Absolutely. It's a simple idea, and it's attractive to alienated young men tending to be between the ages of 18 and 38, somewhere in there, alienated by their broken cultures, by their failed states, oh, yes. alienated because they've been dislocated into Europe or North Africa or some other part of the world, right. alienated and who find the power of a gun and the power of the band of brothers to kill the crusaders, to kill the Christians, to kill anything that isn't like us, that right. doesn't obey us. Right, absolutely. And that makes them a murder cult. And we've, we've dealt with mur murder cults before over the last several hundred years. Well, I'm, I'm not converting, and I'm sure you're not, so it's time for them to die. And Art, here we are, two gentlemen of the 21st century, in agreement. And I observe that is not the conversation in the United States of America. Well, you're right. Uh, not in the in political circles where it needs to be for something to actually get done, I suppose an American city is going to have to be hit in the same way Paris was just hit, or worse. i tell you a story, Art. I was a very young man, and I wrote, I wrote novels. You know this. I was a literary writer. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a, my second novel entitled The Birth of the People's Republic of Antarctica. And in it, mm. I wrote it between 81 and 82. I published it in 83. In it, my characters, for reasons to do with the plot... It was about alienation and refugees and being driven out of your land and not being able to get back in. And it was projected between the year 1972 and 2035. In it, my characters come across the Falkland Islands, and there's a war, and it's been invaded. And there's a battle, and my characters are caught up with it and escape because they see the whole place is burning and it's been overrun by savagery. I wrote that before the Falklands War. And NPR had me on to ask me how I did that, and I didn't have an answer. All right. I didn't have an answer. I published the book the next year. It got a lot of attention, and I never had the answer. But a science fiction friend of mine who's gone now, his name was Tom Dish. He was very popular once upon a time in the 20th century. He came to me and he said, John, how'd you do this? And I said, I don't know. I, and I had a liter, lit, literal experience story to tell that I looked it up and I read it a little bit and I saw the map and it was just, it was a plot device. And he said, do me a favor. All right? He said, whatever you've got, never write about an atomic war. Hmm. Yeah. And I never did, Art. And I've, over the, all these years, and it's what, 30 years later now, I've obeyed that taboo. I don't like to speculate about it. The problem is that that is exactly what ISIS wants to initiate. I can agree with you. Yeah, it's exactly what they want, and we cannot let that happen. Uh, I'm not sure what political cojones we've got to work up to, to get the right group of countries together to get this done, but it's got to get done. It's 70 years since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I just did a story with Charlie Pellegrino, a very detailed story of what it what, that, what those bombs meant, August 6th, August 9th, 45, to the people on the ground, to the survivors, to the single and double survivors. Oh, yes. That horror, that horror is not in our culture. We don't teach it art. The children don't know what it means when you talk about the ant walkers, the yeah. people who've had their upper, their, their, their in a, their, they're no longer able to reason. They're just mechanically moving across the landscape until they drop from dehydration. They don't know what it means to talk about alligator people who've been burned so badly they're dying as they move. Mm -hmm. It's gone. We don't know about it. And that's necessary to recover the, the horror in order to stop it from happening. Well, that's exactly why I did 
a show recently on global thermonuclear warfare, and uh, it was a horror to listen to, but I really felt that the young people needed to know what was on the line here. You can't make intelligent decisions without information. Our Pentagon now, uh, I did a report last week with Josh Rogan, of Bloomberg View, so I was a young correspondent, great sources, works in intelligence. There was a conference recently in Washington attended by Secretary Carter and some very big brains at the DOD. They have an, a concept that is in the think tank part of the DOD. It's called third offset, third offset. The first two offsets were in the 20th century, and they, they describe how America's technology upped the game, so we overwhelmed our adversaries. They're now talking about the third offset because they're anticipating that the Chinese and the Russians have caught us, and they have aerial denial weapons and ability to fight in air, land, sea, and low Earth orbit. So we need a leap, and they can't describe what it is. It's some leap into the future. I think that that is probably what the Pentagon is also thinking about in combating the jihadists, a third offset, some some magical way of defeating the enemy, knowing they're coming for us. I don't believe it. I think it's a I think it's a sales device in Washington right now. Mm-hmm. You cannot beat an idea that means to destroy itself and you with it. You can't beat that. You have to kill it. Yeah, I there we absolutely agree. Anything willing to give its life to take another's is going to nearly always succeed. Um, and, and therefore, there's this, and this is not acceptable in conversation in the U.S. We need allies, allies who live there. And the first ally, the important ally, is Moscow. We need it. Well, I'm not above, uh, John, believing that we are manip- manipulating some news toward Moscow about that plane, for example, and uh, and and perhaps now about what's going on in, in Paris that will move the Russians in the direction we wish them to move, because right now they're just mainly bombing the rebels, not ISIS. We need to work with them somehow. This president has decided that that's not acceptable. We need to work with them. I don't know when it will happen. I don't know what will drive us together. And that's why I asked you if you saw anybody on the horizon who could no. do that. No, 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 no. I look all the time. I well, then the time. that's pretty tragic because this is well, going to wait no, another eight heroes years. Co- heroes come out of crises. Ernest King, commander of the Pacific Fleet, 1941 to 1945. They do tend to, I know. Yes. He was ready to retire they were going to throw him overboard. And then Pearl Harbor and FDR said, you're staying. <laughs> yes, no, you're right. Uh, it, it tends to be true that heroes come along with just the right stuff at the right time for America. I hope that luck holds. It's, 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 it's the great genius of America. We prepared to go in all directions. We have... We have, a, we have a, a deep bench and a rich tool set to call upon depending on the crisis, and I can't predict it. So I know it's mostly hope that we'll find an Ernest King or a George Marshall or a Dwight Eisenhower mm-hmm. when we need them. Mm-hmm. Well, you're an optimist, and I, I'm going to try to be with you, and I, I am going to certainly thank you for being on the air. I know it's very late back here. It must be, what, a little after 1 in the morning? Oh, I work bad news, Art. And, you know, this is early. I work bad news. Yeah, don't don't we all? Well, I'm going to proceed. I've got open lines to do, John, but it was a oh, such a pleasure having you on. And we'll do it again. Let's see how this story proceeds. Who knows? Maybe back on Monday. Thank you, Art. Good night. Thank you, my friend. Good night. All right, we're going to take a break now, and then I am going to do, as promised, an open the lines. That's John Batchelor, very wise man be interesting to see what you thought of what he said, and for that matter, what our other expert, uh, Rickon, said. I'm Art Bell. This is Midnight in the Desert. Right back.
strike 12. And Midnight in the Desert is pounding packets your way on the Dark Matter Digital Network. To call the show, please direct your finger digits to dial 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. Well, all right, obviously the news of the night is what has occurred in Paris. It's terrorism. You've heard uh, two views tonight. Um... A little divergent, but uh, two views, Rick Hahn and uh, John Batchelor. And I want to thank them both uh, heartily for being here tonight. And I now want to invite all of you to join in uh, in any way you want. It's open lines, so you can really talk about anything you want. If you want to talk about Paris, I'm prepared for it. If not, I'm prepared for it. I'm easy. Uh, so here comes the talk. <laughs> My national line is area code 952-225-5278. Are you getting a pencil? It's area code 952-225-5278. Yeah, get this paper out here. Um, and, of course, you can reach us on Skype if you have a, well, a computer, a tablet, an iPhone, whatever or an Android whatever, you can download Skype. Get Skype. Go get it. It's free. Once you've got Skype, you can put us in. It's that easy. Pretty cool, actually. So in North America, Canada, and America, once you've got Skype, go to the little plus sign, that's add a contact, and add us. We are MITD51. As in Midnight in the Desert 51. No spaces. Doesn't matter whether it's uppercase, lowercase. M-I-T-D-5-1. If you're outside the United States, we are, and Canada, we are M-I-T-D-5-5. M-I-T-D-5-5. And then we'll be on your contact list, and when you're moved, you can hit that button and call us instantly, and it's free. Oh, and we also have a first-time caller line, uh, which I'm operating tonight, and uh, that number would be area code 775-285-5800. Once again, 775-285-5800. So whether it be Paris or whatever else you would like to talk about, uh, it's open. Come get it. On the first-time caller line, you are on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. How are you? Well, um, I, I guess like everybody else, I'm very thoughtful about, you know, what's going on in Europe right now and when it's coming here and what we're going to do. Well, I think it's time that we call on the great-grandsons of our greatest generation to get uh, their heads straight, stop looking at their iPhones, look around, see what's happening in this world, and come together for America, stand up for America, let's put this country back on its feet, and get that Muslim out of the White House. He's not a Muslim. I believe he you is. You know he's not a Muslim. No, you know he's not. See, that, that that's where you walk right over the line. He's not a Muslim. He's just not effective. He uh, can't even prove who he is. Uh, well, sure he can. He's got a birth certificate, and he showed it to everybody. That's the problem. Why do people go over the line? You know, I voted for this president first time around. And I am very, very disappointed in his uh, apparent, what's the right way to phrase this, lack of interest in foreign policy as it affects our national security. But no, I don't think he's a Muslim. I think he's ineffective. That's perhaps more of an insult. I mean, that, that's kind of like saying, uh, if you're a talk show host, well, you're boring. There, There isn't any greater insult than boring. You can be a lot of things, but you can't be boring. <sighs> what a night, huh? Uh, let's, let's go here. Uh, hello in New Jersey. Uh, you are on the air. Hey, you are Ed from New Jersey. How are you this evening, sir? Uh, a little perplexed, but I'm okay. Yeah, the yeah, same here. Uh, you know, prayers go out to uh, the people of Paris tonight. And uh, my quick thought on it was, 
you know, unfortunately, I don't think this is going to be a, a one-time deal. I think we might see a few more of these, whether it be here or in other European cities. And uh, I just see history replaying itself here. I see them uh, dragging us, Europe and Russia, into a war, yeah. being allies again. And then, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to be as long as the last war where we were all allies. However, it'll start a new Cold War between us and Russia again. And, uh, you know, I, I just see history repeating. Well, if, if it start, if, look, if it, starts, if it starts a Cold War between us and Russia, then we're not obviously going to be allies to extinguish this problem. No, I meant after, the war, after we extinguish this problem, we'll end up getting into another Cold War, oh. as we did in World War II. Well, you know, if this pre- present, uh, prevents, actually, a big escalation in the Cold War and we have to actually get together to fight a common enemy, you actually could be right. It might at least forestall what's going to inevitably come. It could, and I read a report this morning where ISIS threatened to take out the Kremlin. And Oh, yeah. yeah I was listening on to the news on the radio as I was driving, and I was saying to myself, they're going to go mess up. They're messing with the wrong guy. I mean, we might not agree with Putin's politics, but they go and try anything funny over there. They're done. They're, they're absolutely done. He's not going to think twice. I very, very much appreciate your call, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it's done. I, I do agree with both of my guests tonight that we don't have the political... Uh, construct right now to deal with this, uh, and we're not going to. It's not going to be uh, this president that deals with it. He's just not going to do it. Having said that, um, (laughs) it was probably a painful thing for me to ask either one of these fellows uh, who they saw on the horizon on either side of the aisle who could come along and effectively deal with this. Nobody came up with a name. That in itself is a little concerning. John on Skype, you're on the air. Yeah, good evening, Art. Uh, Nobody could ever accuse you of being boring, that's for sure. Uh, Well, I try yeah, I'm not boring, I guess. (laughs) Uh, The one thing I, when I was listening to your guest talk is, is nobody seems to talk about any hope for intelligence where we can all kind of move the the world along to get rid of this religion stuff. Uh, I, just, uh, I just don't uh, understand how... This religion stuff is what's got us in all this trouble right now. I know. Yeah, so, but, um, I, you know, it's it's everywhere. You're not going to get rid of religion. I know. I listen. I listen to these Republicans talking about, you know, they're they're all they always emphasize that oh they're killing Christians. Well, you know that's just throwing fuel on the fire too. I, I worry more about our guys sometimes, you know. But my only hope is that someday uh, maybe the world will wake up and start thinking about what we can do as a race of humans, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we better wake up before this thing. And by the way, you've got hum in your audio. You might want to look at that. Uh, we're going to have to do something before this infection, and that really is how I think of it as a virus, an infection. And if we don't stop it, if we don't stamp it out, uh, as we finally decided we had to do with uh, uh, what was happening in Africa, or it would have come to get us. It was actively trying, right? It was getting on airplanes, just like people flying to Turkey and then making their way to Syria. A lot of people think I don't... uh, I pay attention to politics, but I do. I am glued to it. Even though I don't discuss it all the time, I'm fully capable of doing so. Uh, it's just that, uh, in general, I find politics boring. When something like this happens, there's no way to avoid a little bit of discussion about politics because it drives national policy. And in this case, national policy damn well better get driven by a competent driver pretty soon, or we're in big trouble. It's like a virus, I'm telling you. They have only one goal, and that is to kill us. I think they have long since decided they're not going to convert us. 
So killing us is their only other uh, option. And if that's the name of the game, then I say kill them first. Right? Let's go uh, to the first-time caller line and say you're on the air. You're on the air. Going once, going twice, gone. You get one shot at that. Uh, let's instead go to uh, Skype and say, yo-ho, you're on the air. Hello, Art. Hi. Go ahead. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> He's gone. Uh, I have a feeling he pushed the wrong button. You know, I know you can get excited and do that. Uh, instead, we'll pick on uh, a crypto lord here. Hello. Art, how you doing tonight? I'm doing real well, thank you. Yeah, I was listening to you earlier, and I was thinking, you think maybe the Navy should possibly test fire a third Trident uh, missile and say, whoops, that one's got a live warhead. And, uh, Gee, look where <laughs> it's going, huh? You maybe uh, treat the cancer with some radiation. Yeah, I know. I know. I, you know, and really, I say that, but I, I know that's not going to happen. And you know that's not really going to happen. Uh, no, it would be too devastating. And plus, you know, the radiation is just going to disperse, and you don't know who else the radiation is going to hit. So it'll be a pretty, it'll be pretty bad if that happened. Well, I guess the only way this is going to get done, boots on the ground, lots of American young men going off to fight yet again another war. I, I hope that we can put together the kind of coalition it's going to take to really do this and. Maybe the world's not quite ready for it. Paris was awful. Uh, I think that uh, if a New York City was hard hit, uh, and I don't mean just New York City, a city here in the U.S. was hit hard, uh, that might be enough to do it. I, I don't know. What about you? You know what I'm worried about is I'm not thinking that New York would be the target next time. I'm thinking possibly it might be Las Vegas just because of... Um, <clears throat> You know, ISIS's beliefs and all that, and, you know, Las Vegas is gambling, uh, sin, yeah, sex, sin city, you know, yeah. everything, you know, right. and I'm thinking, that I gotta hope I'm wrong, but, uh, I keep thinking maybe Vegas might be the next place they might hit. And then it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to Trump. Well, hopefully you and the family will be safe there, <laughs> and Trump, I hope. I don't want to have to be fighting off ISIS in Trump. Thank you very much. Uh, but, but you're right. Las Vegas, uh, is probably a relatively soft target. Although I'll bet you tonight that the big dam out there is being very, very heavily guarded. Oh, I would bet. I bet they are. Yep. Mm-hmm. I so, was going to ask you real quick. I sent you an email, uh, concerning Windows 10. And I don't know if you got it or not. Because I sent it to your uh, the K N Y E. Yeah, what, was that the, that was the thing about um, the privacy issues, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I got it. Good. I got it, brother. Yeah. And thank you. I'm it's I'm considering it. Believe me, I'm considering it. But I don't know when I'm going to make this. I've got seven computers, and the Windows advertisement for Windows 10 keeps getting bigger and bigger. Should I do it or not? Most of my computers have DVD machines, by the way. I'm not convinced. I am of the old school that if it works, leave it alone. Now, I suppose eventually something might change my mind. But right now, I'm just not of a mind to say, okay, make the switch and then go to bed and hope, you know, for the best. It's just not in me. I can't bring myself to click it. So you all tell me, is it a wise move? Or is it wiser to, you know, wait a while? I think I'm voting and acting on the latter. Not just not ready yet. I'm Art Bell, and this is Midnight in the Desert.
to initiate a dialogue sequence with Art Bell, please coordinate your phalanges and call 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. Randy on, uh, on the wormhole is so cruel. Randy said, you bite off ISIS from Trump? You can't even bite off a mouse. Oh, Randy. I wasn't trying to fight off that mouse anyway. I was intrigued by that mouse, uh, nor, if I could have caught it, would I have killed the mouse. The mouse has had no ill intentions that I'm aware of toward me. No, 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 no. I would have... Um... Actually, I tried to feed the mouse. And uh, if I could have caught him, I would have put him in a box and taken him outside and introduced him to the great wild, but he went all on his own. So there you have it. All our phone lines are full, but if you would like to try and get through... You're welcome in uh, so many ways. Public number, 952-225-5278. Skype for North America, MITD51. The rest of the world, MITD55. And, of course, the first-time caller line, if I can find that number, which is area code 775-285-5800, whether it's Paris you want to talk about or anything else. And I love Paris, by the way. I really love Paris. I've been there a number of times. In fact, it accounts for one of the times that I quit. Well, I didn't quit. I got fired. (laughs) From KDWN in Las Vegas, what happened was um, that the company that operated the Concorde, you remember that? We used to have supersonic flying. Uh, They contacted me and said, Hey, Art, how would you and your wife like a free trip to Paris on the Concorde from Las Vegas? (laughs) No. Right. You don't get that every day. So I went to my boss, Claire, and I said, Claire, I'm going to Paris in the Concorde. I hope it'll be okay. She said, you're fired. Uh, I said, that's okay. I quit. And I walked out and uh, went to Paris, had a great time, came back, and immediately got rehired. So <laughs> it all worked out. That was one of about five times I got fired there, actually. Uh, Stephen on Skype. Hello. Hello, Art. Uh, extinguish your whatever, please. Hello, is it good now? Uh, turn it off. All the way off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, standing by. Good? Okay, good. Hi. Hi. Um, I want to say uh, a couple things. Um, yes. Three things. Okay. Firstly, I'd like to say that your guest tonight, um, your little mini guest, whatever you want to call him, <laughs> mini was, <guess. laughs> was absolutely correct um, about, um, about, a, about a player basically emerging. Um, like an unknown player, I think, is absolutely going to emerge um, from basically once we really hit bottom, which we haven't hit. Um, it's been with, like, quantitative, quantitative easing and no. any other sort of uh, inflations or, um, or rather uh, whatever you want to call them. I know. I um, kind of like what you already came up with in the political spectrum. It's like quantitative easing. <laughs> That's very good. Next. Um, but about, about that... Um, uh, my dad's been saying that literally since about like 2008. Um, oh. Even though it's it's been bad, I mean it it just hasn't gotten so bad that it's like abysmal. Like for it's um like not to sound uh like an alarmist, but basically honestly like like Weimar Germany like before it fell basically. Yeah. Um, I absolutely believe that not like a Hitler, but when we do hit bottom, we're going to have someone who would either be horrible, um, or who will probably be who will be either horrible for us or great for us, one way or the other, but it'll be something like that, and I honestly believe it'll change the country dramatically and for a very long time. And what do you think um, What do you think would happen, uh, Stephen, if we began to get a lot of attacks like the Paris attack here in, well, the, in the U.S., or, or even worse, a dirty bomb? Um, that actually kind of ties into the second thing I wanted to talk about, which okay. was this... Bulgarian psychic or whatever that uh, my ex-girlfriend told me about. Baba Vanga, have you ever heard of her? No. Sorry. Okay. Um, she was this blind woman. She um, she predicted a bunch of things. Um, again, like I only heard about this like a couple of years ago, but it was way before ISIS, anything like that. All right. What did she predict? Um, she predicted um, she was a little off in her years, like in her uh, like time frame, but yeah. something she's apparently been right about. Um, she predicted that um, Europe would be attacked. By, by the Muslims, or by rather Muslims, um, mm. and they would attack it with chemical weapons, and Europe would be basically decimated. The United States would be mostly fine. Um, eventually, in like over the course of like eighty, like something like 
I think in like 80 years, like after like that course of events, um, a revolution would start basically in France, and that would pretty much start the end of like the reign of the Muslims like in Europe. Um, okay. So I think that was a kind of interesting, especially since it was way before uh, Syria or anything else like that. Right. Okay, um, you've got one more big thing. Oh, yes. And how that ties into, yeah, by the way, um, the first thing I was talking about when you asked me um, what do you think would really happen, I think um, chemical attacks, serious chemi- chemical attacks and serious decimation of like the European economy would absolutely affect our economy and would just destroy our way of life. Um, so I do believe that that would be one of the things that would bring about, bring about um, a uh, dramatic change in our way of life. All right. Um, Beyond that, um, the third thing I want to talk about was actually your first your first caller, um, where you said uh, you started to talk about um, uh, like current generation like stop looking at their iPhones. I mean, I'm from that generation, yes. And honestly, like in my opinion, um, the problem is mostly not our generation, but rather just in general, we aren't any worse than any previous or any preceding generation, baby boomers, what have you. Um, are no treat have been no uh, no particular boon to the country. Um, it's just that if you look at how horribly set up the country is just structurally, how many how many just structural differences disadvantages that we have for like the future, mm. um, be it uh, population growth rates, um, whatever you want to call it, well, um, whatever you want to bring up. What, um, honestly, we, we have so many things coming to a head at this point where mm. there has to be a dramatic change or right, right, right. we're just oh, totally right. kind of screwed. Right. Well, when the fertilizer hits the fan, we'll find out uh, what this generation is made of. I wonder how they would react. It, it is kind of an interesting question in a lot of ways because, of course, uh, when Vietnam was the issue, many declined to participate, went to Canada and did other things. So I don't think we're going to find out really the answer to that question until, as I mentioned, the fertilizer hits the fan. Going overseas to Sean. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Uh, I have to tell you the truth. I'm really scared. Where Where are you, Sean? Uh, Japan. Japan. Okay. Well, you're, you're at the moment, uh, I think, fairly safe. Um with respect to geographically what's going on, the awful stuff. Well, yes, it, Japan is an isolated nation and pretty native in its outlook and taking in immigrants and whatnot. But it sure is. Uh, did you, uh, by the way, did you feel the seven-point earthquake that occurred off Okinawa earlier? Didn't even notice it. Didn't uh, even might notice. have been on the news, but didn't feel anything here. Nothing shook or anything. Okay. <laughs> But, uh, no, the thing I just wanted to say was about 10 years ago, uh, the United States military and its allies had operations going all over the world to take care of terrorists, and there was a lot of stuff that just people didn't know about. Um, they were training, SF was training in the Philippines and down in Africa and the Middle East, of course, and from what I'm hearing from people still in the military today, it's, it's uh, the Obama administration has really cut back on that. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's political will to deal with uh, ISIS the way that Bush did. Okay, with, uh, okay. all right, then let me try the same question on you, if I can, that I did on my guests. If, if you could, as you look around the political landscape right now, is there anybody uh, either running or thinking of running that you think could take care of the problem? Nobody on the Republican side really impresses me too much. Uh, definitely nobody on the Democratic side, but if I had to pick one, I'd probably say Donald Trump. Donald, well, he's on the... Well, I don't know where he is, actually. Thank you. <laughs> Donald actually is uh, running as a Republican. He's probably not a Republican. He's somewhere in between which I guess for some people would make him uh, an attractive option. Now, the problem is that um, since we're rarely do I talk politics, but I think that Trump is on the verge of falling apart. Now, I say that 
not because I want him to fall apart, but uh, because I don't see him articulating any sort of national issues beyond the one uh, that he has picked, you know, immigration and a, a couple of others. I think Trump would be effective in dealing with China. He knows China. He knows uh, trade policies. Economically, he'd be not so bad. But uh, unless he begins articulating rather quickly what issues uh, really are important to Americans right now, then I think he will be cast aside. And that's just an opinion for whatever it's worth, and that's not much. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Is that me, Art? That is you, sir. Uh, this is Jay in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, home of the Manhattan Project. And you have, and you have never, never called before? No, sir. Welcome. No, sir. Thank you very much. I'm so happy you're back on the air. We Thank love you. Thank you. I've got one question I want to ask you. It's been puzzling me for some time now. Sure. Uh, why do you say every night uh, covering all 25 time zones? Because that's how many there are. Uh, where did we gain the 25th time zone? It's like stuck There's in... only 24 hours in a day. Yeah, I know, but... There's there's an area where things are on the half hour. It's really crazy. You have to look. There actually are 25 time zones. Well, I'm going to have to check into that. <laughs> well, Google can help you out. How many right. time zones? Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll check there then. Okay. Thank you very much, Art. You're very Good welcome. You. Yep, take care. Okay, let's, I don't know, Bill on Skype, you're on the air. Hi. Hey, it's Bill the Atheist, <laughs> and you are my hopeful friend. Bill, you're still breaking up, buddy. Oh, am I breaking up? Yeah, it's probably your religious point of view. <laughs> I'm calling also about Windows 10. I'm in IT, and um, you say you have seven computers, right? That's right. I'll put it on one and play with it and see what you think. Well, there is that. Um, I've considered doing that, but I don't know. I get I get the little square down there, and it says, do it now, do it now, do it now, and I just can't click it. My best advice is if you are concerned with want to click it, just double-check, go to your manufacturer's website, and make sure that they have the drivers compatible for all right, listen, I, I'm going to uh, ask that you do a little work, Bill, on your Skype. It could be um, actually your Internet provider, but you're cutting out. So you probably have a little bit of what's known as jitter in your um, upside uh, Internet on that side. You might want to look into it, but it's, it's, it's kind of weird. When, when Skype is good, it's very, very good. And when it's bad, it's um, still actually tolerable most of the time, unless you've got bad uh, Internet. Let's go to Kennewick, Washington, on the phone. Hello. Hello, Mr. Bell. Hi. Uh, well, my question revolves around this tragedy that happened tonight. Um, you had just mentioned Donald Trump. Um, with his immigration plan, do you think that it will galvanize the American public seeing the terrorist attacks that happened to France and seeing people gravitate even more to Donald Trump? I think that, uh, here's what I think. That I think that the terrorist attack on Paris is probably going to help, if anybody, Trump. Yeah, I mean, I you know, it's, yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I mean, what we've seen in the eight years of Obama in the White House has just been like a shame, and anything we can do to get Obama... In that will be a great day for America. Uh, everybody gets so mean in what they say. <laughs> Thanks for the call. I, I cut out what, uh, you, you know, it's, it's like calling the president a Muslim, right? Or I won't go into what he said, but I'm not going to allow that. And it, it's not productive in, in the discussion of what to do anyway. Uh, let's go to Dave on Skype. Hello, Dave. Hey. Hey. Oh, um, may, I, may I just say that it's absolutely a delight to talk to you. You may. Mr. Mr. Bell, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
although I require you and your audience a bit of a patience with me because I don't uh, English is not my mother tongue. What is? I, <laughs> what is your mother tongue? It, it's Russian, actually. Russian. Oh, Russian. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Proceed. Well, yeah. Though I'm not from Russia per se, I'm from a country that's called Turkmenistan. Okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> Many people can point the uh, finger on the globe on the globe to point that uh, country, but it's um, ex USSR. Um, sure. Sort of a satellite republic. Sure. Now it's an interesting topic today, and I was shocked to find out, as everybody else, uh, what happened in France. Uh, but I just want to say that I was uh, back in Moscow. <clears throat> I think it's uh, about 2003 when uh, they had a hostage situation in their um, North Ost. Right. Uh, I believe it was called uh, the. The musical, um, the show that they had, and there was about uh, 700 hostages. I recall. Was taking, yeah. So I was, I, as I was hearing, I was teaching at that moment when that happened today, actually, and I was thinking about that uh, back in Moscow, and I was hoping that French um, government would contact uh, uh, the Russian government, <laughs> so to speak, to kind of get those. Um, uh, those clues and those uh, tactics that they were using back then and what they learned. Because from what I remember, uh, they were, the Russians, Spetsnaz, that's the special, uh, right. um, um, tactical group, they were using this sort of a sleep gas. Yes. In, you remember that, right? I, oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, well, so, I, I want to say something here, and it is oh. this. Uh, in the theater, uh, where most of the people died, I noticed that uh, the the French authorities waited way, way too long. There, there were actually messages being sent by hostages inside saying, for God's sakes, raid this place. They're killing us one by one, picking us off like birds. And, and still they waited. Uh, and I think that was wrong. When you encounter a group like ISIS, if that's who it was, or uh, these jihadists, they have only one goal, and that is to kill as many people as they can. So once you know that, you don't wait, because there is not going to be any bargaining. There's not going to be any back and forth. There's just going to be dead people. And that is surprising to me as well. Well, I didn't know the details. That's the first details I'm hearing from you. Uh, I've read some of it, but uh, this is very surprising to me. And given the fact, if if uh, you remember, and I'm sure your audience remember, I think it was just past this year, uh, Charlie Hebdo. Yes. It was very I, close geographically, actually. Exactly. Well, it, it, was it in France, wasn't it? It was in Paris. Uh, it was only a few blocks yeah. away, actually. And so what's striking me is that the measures, the measures that were not taken, given the fact that those uh, armed... Um, Radicals were with a weapon in, uh, at the um, at the uh, at the show. I believe the American band uh, metal right. metal band was playing at that time, and they had those AK-47 uh, in inside of that club. That was just kind of a really strange and inconsistent with uh, with the previous. Yeah, events that happened. So I would back in Russia <laughs> when when that unfortunate event happened, I knew that things were much more tighter in in a sense of security because you can't turn the corner, but there was security all over the place. All right, listen, I'm I'm sorry, I've got to run on you. I very very much appreciate your point of view and your call, and we'll be back. We're going to take a brief break. From the high desert, a very, very sad day for France and Paris. I'm Art Bell.
Midnight in the Desert. To call the show, if you're east of midnight, call 1-952-CALL-ART. If you're west of midnight, call 1-952-225-5278. And make sure you use the right line. I mean, pick one of those and do it. <laughs> All right, uh, we're in open lines. Anything is fair game. The uh, story in Paris, the sad story. God, there's a lot of people to be killed um, in in one terrorist strike. It's a Mumbai, Mumbai-like strike, right? Just go in with guns, explosives, and kill as many people as you can. That was the entire goal. Whether they still have anybody loose over there or not is entirely another question. Let us uh, go to let's go to Phantom, I guess. Hello there, on Hello Skype. There. Hi. How are you? Is that all right? Just fine, yes. All right. Well, my heart goes out to everybody affected, not just in Paris, but around the world. Because I'm pretty sure a lot of families are affected by this. Of course. And I I had a few things I wanted to talk to you about. I I don't normally get Fridays off, so I always listen to the replay of Open Lines. And you had a really good show on last week, and I wanted to call and share one of my stories with you real quick, if that's all right. It is. Well... I am convinced that I was a bird in one of my past lives. Really? I'm, I'm darn convinced. I, all my life I've had dreams that I fly. I just jump off my feet and fly. I've flown all over the world and I see everything from a top down perspective. Are you tempted to flap your arms? I do. I recall flapping my arms actually. (laughs) Okay. So, right. You know, just like a bird would. And sure. It's just, you know, I'm wondering if maybe I was a bird. I mean, I try to talk to people, and they don't understand what I'm saying. Oh, I do. And what kind of bird do you think you might have been? I'm thinking I might have been a bluebird or maybe a, maybe a robin. Okay. I thought you were going to probably say something like eagle. No, no. Uh-huh. So maybe a, a robin or a bluebird. That's That's fair enough. Yeah, oh, and I forgot to mention, I listened to you on AM 630 in Utah. Oh, well, that is it's so kind. Do you know the call letters? It's KTKK. They go by K-Talk. That's the way to do it, brother. I really appreciate your giving uh, the affiliates a... You know, I keep forgetting to ask people to do that, but I, I think it's important. Yeah, I don't pick it up very well at my house, but when it, you know when it does fade out, I, I switch over to the Internet. But mm-hmm. you sound... Loud and clear on the AM dial. Well, we try. We pride ourselves on audio, on very, very clear audio, and uh, I think we've achieved it. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the the stuff going on in Paris. You know, I I sleep during the day, so I got up. I you know I'm just finding out about what's going on. Right. Has any of the terrorist organizations taken credit? Yeah. No, um, the last I heard, ISIS is celebrating all over the Internet, but they have yet to officially uh, claim credit. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. It could be that uh, uh, they still have operatives uh, in Paris that are loose. It could be other attacks are planned and they're waiting. So they have said things like, be patient, like we're going to take credit, just hang in there. That's kind of scary when they say be patient like that. Yes. Because you don't know what they're going to do if they're going to attack next. Well, just think, if it had been earlier in your life, you'd have really had a bird's eye view of all this. <laughs> <laughs> i got to run, but, but thank you very, very much for the call. And, yes, you can listen to our shows, uh, folks, through uh, the Internet uh, when you want them. You get actually two benefits by joining the Time Travelers group. I rarely do an ad for this, but uh, here it is. Um, Benefit number one, you can download the show on our RSS feed. They're really cool. And just listen when you want to on your phone, tablet, whatever, computer, all of that. So we every single show is about an hour after it's done is up there on the RSS feed for you. That's one thing. Second thing is you get the benefit of the wormhole. So you can send messages to me, um, either positive or negative. I tend to read more of the negative ones than the positive ones, 
just because. I don't know why, but they, they catch my eye, and, and for some reason I want to address them. Uh, in Hollywood, uh, Florida, I guess, you're on the air. Your show. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Never, never, never use your last name on the air, so I had to bleep that out. Oh, okay. I apologize. Sir. First names only. Okay. okay. Understood. So your name is? Uh, Brian. Brian. Welcome. I started listening after your episode with Joe Rogan. Oh, yes. Um, I had a couple of questions. I was wondering if um, the Dark Matter Network noticed an increase in listeners after that uh, show, because I've been listening to the Dark Matter Network every night since. So I was just curious about that. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the Dark Matter Network has noticed a gigantic increase all across the board, actually. Not just since that show, but since we went on. Well, that's excellent. Um, I'm very glad. Um, there's great programming on it, and I've recommended it to a couple of my friends. Thank you. Uh, we depend and, uh, on that, too. That's called grassroots. How, that's how we grow. Indeed. And the second question was, when, if, if possible, where are you going to go on the Joe Rogan experience? You know what I really want to do with Joe? I want to try his uh, sensory deprivation tank out. Yes, I, I was also curious about that. I would love to hear your experiences on it. More than going on his show, I would like to try that tank out. So I'm toying seriously with that idea. Um, yes, excellent. Um, in relation to the um, French attacks, I only wanted to mention one thing, um, and that's that's just meditation, just taking 15 minutes out of the day to just sit down. Notice your breath. I think it's important to not be reactive in this time, but rather to observe our thoughts and to notice our impulses. I think that may help in some way. Uh, it may. Thank you. Um, I'm not against that at all. I think that uh, intent is extremely important, whether it's expressed through religious belief in prayer or just simple concentration or whatever you want to call it, I think it can have an effect. I am hesitant to um, uh, to direct many people in one, you know, toward one thing or another. Ever since the experiments I did, as you know, but uh, should it be important enough, I definitely can get behind it. William on Skype. Hello. Yeah, uh, or I've listened to you for I don't know quite a while. I remember as a kid, you know, used to get yelled at by my parents. You know, turn the radio off. You got school tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that was always kind of funny, but Where, what, what, so may I ask what you're calling on? Uh, my laptop. Your laptop. Okay. Look carefully at your laptop. There's a little bitty hole, like in the the rim somewhere there, where the microphone actually I, is, and you, you want to get close to that. Okay, is that better? It is. Okay. Uh, another thing, uh, real quick, I started listening to you on the TuneIn uh, app, which I actually found on my PlayStation, so I can actually listen to you through the TV. Yeah, Xbox, too. It's really cool. But what I was uh, calling about was, uh, of course, like everybody else, the French attacks tonight, and I just wanted your opinion on uh, the uh, concealed carry. You know, I know Europe, you know, in general is pretty anti-gun, and do you think it would have made much of a difference if concealed carry was, you know, I do. a legal idea? At I least do. somebody on the inside may have had a chance to, you know, maybe save at least one life because you saw how long it took for any officers to show up and do anything. Yes, sir. I, I think what you have brought up is really important. I imagine in France they're going to have a lot of discussion about this now, don't you? That's kind of what I'm thinking, too, but I'm thinking, on the other hand, it may have that opposite effect here. You know, a mask, you know, well, you know, gunmen going in, so that's more fuel to the current political, you know, thinking around here is now we need to get rid of everybody's, you know, firearms. So it could have an not, opposite Not in America, sir. A lot of things might happen in America, but that would be about last on the list. Uh, Americans are not going to give up their guns. I have had a carry permit for uh, most of my adult life and wouldn't be without it. I totally agree. I'm in the process of getting mine myself, just waiting on the, the next class to start here in town. and then. 
So that'll be good. Yeah, I just think that it's, you know, a decent idea. Because you may not be able to prevent the entire tragedy, but if you can save one life, I mean, it's well worth it. All right, sir. Thank you very much for the call. I think you'll find, if you look at the statistics, that uh, uh, there is very little to no trouble that comes from people who possess carry permits. And I think the authorities, frankly, have figured that out, too. And if you look for, well, you know, where most of the people are getting murdered and plowed down, it's in areas that forbid guns. Right? Let's try the uh, first-time caller line. You're on the air. Well, good good evening, Art. Good evening, sir. Turn your device um, off, please. My device? Yeah, you whatever it radio? is. What Radio, yes. Okay. I hate doing that to you, but it's off. You're not doing there that to me. Uh, when you're on the phone, it feeds back, so it's not good to have on when you're actually on the air. Well, I'm sorry about that. I'm a first-time caller and a I've, long-time I've, listener. I've got it. Right. So, you. But you may have noticed that when you get on the line, you automatically begin hearing, uh, you know, the audio from the show. So at that point, you can turn your radio down. Okay. Well, it was. Um, I can listen to you on the phone, and then it would come on the radio. That was cool. But anyway, um, I'm works. an ex-vet. Right. I'm an ex-combat vet. Right. And I'm tempered by war and disciplined by a hard and bitter peace. Um, when I got out of the military, I commanded a 15-man fire team. Mm-hmm. And um, we guarded nuclear weapons, warheads, components. I even guarded the President of the United States. My call sign was Spike. Okay. S-P-I-K-E. I got it. Security police intercepting and killing the enemy. That's exactly what we did every day. We trained, we critiqued, we trained, we could, and we did the okay. job. Well, well, Spike, uh, what is it that you think should be done with all this ISIS business? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to fix our country. Along our southern and northern borders, we don't build a wall. We build two. And inside of it, we put it about a mile apart. And inside of it, we put prisons. Prisons? Not one person, not one person will jump that wall to get into our country. I thought you were going to go for a moat, maybe with, no. you know, fish. We take and, we, we, we take and get rid of Gitmo. I see. Well, and Gitmo's on the way out anyway, you know. Walls. The president is slowly bringing all the Gitmo prisoners up into the U.S. Yeah, well, uh, take them and put them in the, uh, put them inside the wall and they won't have anywhere to go. And we clean the co- we close the country. Close it. Well, France just shut, closed shut you know, the doors. It amazed me. I, the country you know, I hear you. I've never heard of a country like France closing its borders. I guess it happens, but boy, that's pretty rare. I'm not talking about France. I'm talking about the I know. US of A. I know. We I know. close the borders. Get yes. rid of the illegal aliens. And lock up, uh, uh, in World War II when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, we gathered up every Japanese American and put them in a place where we could watch them. Yes, and we're not that proud of the fact we did that. I'm not saying it was a good thing, but we severed a finger to save the hand. Okay? Well, I, we, I understand it. I, you know, it was a sad kind of history, uh, in the, in this country that we did that but yeah I do understand it believe me I really do understand it the the fear was palpable then let's go to um, uh, let's see let me pick one Kirkwood uh, Missouri I believe hello actually it's uh, Jeff from Ferguson Missouri Ferguson really yeah famous Ferguson Uh, yeah I got a cell phone, and I don't know why it says Kirkwood on the ID. Maybe it has something to do with the cell towers. Could be, yes. Doesn't matter. Uh, we've, anyway, we've got you, so go ahead. Yeah, um, the thing, uh, you want to know how this generation might handle the um, ISIS threat and all that stuff? I do. Uh, I think we have a perfect example from what's going on in Mizzou right now. St. Louis, I mean, Missouri, University of Missouri. Yes. 
they they are they are there are students from the zoo that are upset that the Paris story is taken from their little tension tensor tantrum they're having over there right now. Mm-hmm. They're, ma- they're they're thinking that's more important than what's going on over there. Well, uh, you can't control the headlines now, can you? And I'm sure that a lot of the presidential candidates are upset with it as well. It steals the news cycle for many days to come. Yeah, and I think what needs to happen is if they want a if they want a uh, global conflict fight, fight, I can't pronounce that word. Uh, we need to have a global crusade, and we can't be afraid to say that word anymore. And that's what it will take. Well, that's what they're doing against us right now, essentially, is a crusade. Yeah, well, they want a global caliphate. A caliphate. Uh, caliphate. They want a, a caliphate, yes, but in in pursuit of that, they have a crusade. And it just hit Paris. But we got a president who's, an, who's afraid to say Islamic terrorism. He won't even say the word. I um, agree with you, sir. And um, I think we'll take something. Hap- I think we'll provide material support and all that stuff for France but until something happens here. I don't think we'll actually get physically involved. Mm-hmm. I appreciate the call, thank you, and I do also agree with that. We do have a president who is afraid to say that, and I'm not afraid to say it. I I voted for the man first time around. And I am so incredibly disappointed with his uh, foreign policy. Lack of decisions. Shall I put it that way? Lack of decisions. I think that's fair. Um, Okay, you're on the air from Anchorage, I believe, Alaska. Hi. Hi. uh, My name's Mark. Hey, Mark. Hi. been listening to you actually for many years. I just found your show again. It's, it's been very pleasant this evening, other than the horrible news, of course, out of Paris. Yes. But I was listening to your first two guests earlier, mm-hmm. and I think the one thing that our country is missing and that they don't cover in the press, and it drives me nuts every time I watch it, is contact. This movement didn't appear out of nowhere overnight. These terrorists just didn't pop up in our generation. Oh, indeed not. I came of age in the the 1970s, so I remember Arafat. It was going on back then. I remember the Entebbe raid. You know, these things were happening back then. Yes, sir. Um, But what really lit the fuse on this was what happened in Iraq, what we did in Iraq. Uh, CNN is actually running a pretty good show right now called The Road to Hell, and it's about Iraq and what we did in Iraq. Right, but we went into Iraq to a degree to clean up our own mess. Look at what Iraq was doing. You know, uh, are you familiar with this with, with Project Babylon that was going on over there, where they were building an artillery piece capable of showing Tel Aviv from Baghdad? And what went on with Joe? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of all these stories that were out there. Um, thank you for the call, but. I'm not going down that road. There there was no good reason to start a war with Iraq. None at all. It was manufactured. It was a case, in my opinion, of making the intel say what you wanted it to say so you could justify a war that otherwise was completely unjustifiable. So we went in there, sacrificed American treasure, American lives, and then we walked out completely, just vanished. Said, okay, that's it. Mission accomplished, I believe was the phrase. And then we completely left the country. We disassembled the government. So there were, by the time we left, there was no real government there, and there wasn't going to be. And we just left. And so we created a vacuum. And nature abhors a vacuum. Truly it does. And so ISIS came along in Syria and then uh, Iraq to fill that vacuum. I'm telling you, we lit that fuse. James on Skype, you're on the air. Hi. Um, I remember you having that uh, experiment where you got to um, heal people. And uh, I've also read that you can uh, change 
you know, um, uh, things around the world, uh, like stop crime a little bit. What about some suggestions? What would we, uh, or throw it out to the audience, what would be the best, like, mass experiment we could do right now? You know, would it be calm the minds of those guys? You know, just just a thought to throw out there. If anybody has any thoughts on a good uh, meditation, or, or not a meditation, but a, a mass prayer that we could conduct on, you know, hopefully you'd be open to something like that and to ease the stuff over there. I'm open to it, but I don't do it lightly. Uh, in other words, I, I'm worried about, well, you ever listen to these uh, these medical ads on TV where they, they try to sell you a pill for whatever, and then they list 35 uh, possible side effects, including death? Right. Well, that's why, I, you know, if we uh, had an open discussion see, and everybody uh, try to agree on one idea, to see what, you know, if there one great idea comes up, what would be the best thing to meditate on, you know? Okay. It sounds like you're in a windstorm. Where are you? <laughs> I'm sitting outside. Sorry. No, that's all right. I'm trying to catch a that's all right. You are in a windstorm. Then. Um, right. I, okay, well, I'll, I'll consider it, as I have said many times on the air, but I don't want to tamper uh, with things that I don't fully understand. Simple as that. Let's go to um, hmm, first-time caller line. Let's try it out. Hello. 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 Uh, yes, um, I'm calling from WQTT 1270. Uh, here in Marysville, Ohio. That's the way to do it. Thank you. And, uh, sir, when you go off this evening, uh, one of your protégés, I listen to on WTVN, 610 TV um, radio here in... I see. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that a lot of your listeners will agree with what I'm going to say. But okay. It seems that the youngsters, our youngsters now, and I'm from the time when we had the draft. I do not believe in the draft, so we'll go there first. I did enlist, which I, there are a lot of kids enlisting, but I don't think that the, a lot of the underprivileged, a lot of the kids that just don't have any idea what they're going to do with their lives. Yeah, let's, let, let me try something out on you, sir. You said you don't believe in the draft, right? Right, but I'm. But if you'll let me just a second, I I, I will. Uh, but then I want to interject something. So go ahead. Okay. If we would basically go back to the initial thought of okay, let's extend school t- two to three years. But those, basically, after you graduate, jump into the military for two to three years. You're going to have your GI Bill when you come out, all the benefits when you come out. And there's many things in the military you can do besides go to war. But at the same time, we're going to pull a lot of these kids that are underprivileged, a lot of these kids that don't know where they're going, to learn something not only about um, welding, um, being a barber, working in a shop somewhere, working with motors. There are many things that you can do. Be an MP. I've been through quite a few. Um, once you do that, their minds are going to be reset away from the way the kids are thinking now because they're going to get that responsibility. They're going to get the training. They're going to get all of that. Plus, they're going to get the GI Bill to go back to college if they want to go when they're done. Okay, well, you, you sound like a recruiter. Um, and that's I fine. I, I I agree with you. I mean, uh, you know, they're going to get all of that, but that's if they decide to join. Uh, my question no, for I, you... I, I just, just extend their time after high school. Yeah, my question for you, sir, was uh, why not the draft? Because the draft is taking a select, a select few of us. They're not able to go ahead and take those kids that don't have a chance in life that don't have an opportunity to learn something. They're going to be in the slums. They're going to be someplace in the middle of Chicago where they're shooting at each other. Take all of them. Take everyone when they come out of high school. Give them the two years or three years, whichever they choose to do. You mean whether they they want it or not? Just, yeah. Okay, well, then your whole call doesn't make sense because you said you don't want the draft. 
So if you don't want the draft, you're, you're, you're saying after they come out of high school, make it compulsory for them to go into the military. That's the same as a draft. No, the draft, they chose numbers. Okay. <laughs> so we're just arguing about the method of compulsory service? That's all we're arguing about. Not much of an argument. Let me go to uh, Florida. Hello. Hello? Hello? Yes. Hi. Uh, this is Bill in Tampa. Hey, Bill. First of all, I'm very glad you're back on the show, Art. Thank you. And secondly, I really, really like the clearness of your sound over the Internet. It's fantastic. Isn't that something? That's it's, it's really quite amazing. Uh, it's what we were shooting for. You know, we wanted a good, clear sound. Um, because, believe me, in, my, in the last incarnation of my show, I didn't have that. Right. I understand. Now, I'm not on the Internet now. I'm calling via, basically, Fios, which I guess maybe is the Internet. I don't know. But uh, I'm calling on a landline, so to speak. But uh, I do listen to you on the Internet, and the sound is really great. Uh, I also wanted to put out something which may not be real popular tonight. And my concern is, given... My concern is that the backlash to that will be further deprivation of rights in this country. We will say, oh, please, government, protect us, Mm -hmm. uh, help us, keep us safe, which means a further tightening of all of the freedoms we used to have. That's a good observation, uh, and, and it's very likely. And, and and my position is that we used to be a country where we were presumed innocent. I think that is no longer the case. We're now presumed guilty. And, um, I mean, I, I was at an organization meeting, for example, a small example, where an FBI agent came and spoke to us. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, if the FBI is, in, in, is investigating somebody, there's got to be some problems. Got to, they've got to be guilty of something. Mm-hmm. And that kind of attitude really concerns me. And I, that's my primary point that I wanted to make. Well, Hillary, too. Yeah. Oh, to, to put it mildly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so... It, it's it's uh, you know it's something we, I don't know how to balance that I, I don't have a solution but uh, it, it the, the thing that we're looking at is certainly we need to have some kind of, of safeguards and protections but the other side of that is the coming if not already present police state which seems to be so prevalent in the U S and around the world if you will it is beginning to feel that way isn't it yes it is. Uh, if, if you're old enough, and I'm old enough, uh, well, I can remember. Okay, well, I can remember, and then so can you, back when we actually had freedoms. Thing is that a lot of these youngsters don't remember the kind of freedom that we enjoyed, and therefore don't really miss it. You know what I mean? And it's very, it's very sad and scary. Thank you for the call, sir. Appreciate it. Clock strikes 12, and Midnight in the Desert is pounding packets your way on the Dark Matter Digital Network. To call the show, please direct your finger digits to dial 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. It is indeed, and we're talking about many things tonight. It's actually open lines, but of course the the attack in Paris is uh, pretty much on everybody's mind. And what happened, happened uh, in Paris can certainly happen here. And I think that kind of doubly puts it on everybody's mind. This uh, spreading virus, this caliphate, whatever you want to call it, has to be dealt with, and I think soon. And we had better find somebody capable of dealing with it. All right. That said, to Skype and uh, Frank. Going once, Frank. Going twice. And gone. Uh, Windsor, Ontario. You're on the air. Hi. 
Hey, it's uh, Chad from Windsor, Ontario, and I just want to call and say that I love you, Art. Well, that, well thank you, Art. I'd rather you like me a lot, but thank you. Well, same thing, same thing, but you have a good night. Oh, that's it? <laughs> yep, that's it. All right, then, on we go. You're on the air. Hello. That jing you sound are. means you're on the air. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, you bring up so many things tonight. Uh, first of all, I love John Batchelor. I, uh, I'm really into history and, uh, military history of that, and I enjoyed him a lot. He is something, isn't he? Uh, yes, he is. You brought up a couple of things that I haven't had heard anyone have the guts to say. The first one is the nuclear al- alternative in the Middle East. Uh, uh, I know you certainly had a bunch out in your neck of the woods, and everybody seems to have survived. Uh, eventually, uh, and uh, I don't see why anyone has not mentioned it before you. Uh, Probably because yeah. it's not actually realistic. Uh, in other words, if if you had ISIS all in one geographic area, and you could be sure that the, um, uh, the you, you know the innocent civilians weren't going to get slaughtered in large numbers, then maybe, but uh, that's why. I mean, it's it, it's it's an emotional reaction more than an intellectual one. Well, let me give you another one. Okay. Uh, you ask the question, who would be strong enough to take care of this? First of all, you probably remember that the Islamics destroyed the uh, library in Alexandria, Egypt. Mm-hmm at least 3,000 years ago, and they have never done anything except try to keep people ignorant for that period of time. And I've thought for a long time that we were at war with Islam. And uh, what I'm afraid of is the only way that we're going to be able to deal with it is the same way that uh, Adolf Hitler tried to... uh, Aye, aye, aye. Do the Jews? Yeah, uh, that's horrible. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I don't want it. You know, I'm I'm not advocating it, but I'm afraid that uh, that's the only thing that's going to be able to stop them because they're all. Well, in the world. all right. Let me say this. Um, first of all, it is a truth that it is far from being just Islam that is a problem. It's the the radicalized. Uh, arm or part of um, Islam that's the problem, the radicalized part. Islam is a gigantic religion, and for the most part, peaceful. However, um, could it eventually turn into a basically a war between Christianity or the West and Islam? I, I would hope not. And so every president has to be careful to say it is not a war or a problem we have with all of Islam, it is the radicalized group who somehow has found in the same book that the peaceful people use language that to them indicates murder and genocide is the only way uh, to they want to spread. I don't know how they find those words, and they can't seem to make, you know, when you actually get somebody who is radicalized on and you ask them that question, they generally will quote something that makes no sense at all, except perhaps to them. In Las Vegas, you're on the air. Art, uh, this is uh, Joe WBT. Right. Okay. Uh, just something i got to get off my chest with regard to what has, what has occurred since, the, uh, since Bush 43. Okay. I mean, the... I mean, this guy was an upper crust dimwit, had no sense of history, geography, economics, let alone, let alone morality or manners. As a, had a sociopath war profiteer for a vice president. And look, he, look what he's done as far as opening up the gates of hell, uh, in terms of revving up Islam. The invasion of an Islamic country for what? Weapons of mass destruction? That was basically a delusion to begin with. It was. And yes. And, you know, I mean, we the, the trillions of dollars that we had borrowed from the Chinese 
to carry on with this guy's folly. Mm -hmm. I, I really contend that that Bush, Cheney, Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld, there should actually be put up for on trial, tried, convicted, and and sentenced mm -hmm. to prison. I mean, this none of this would have occurred had we just simply. Uh, gone after the bad guys in Afghanistan, and that would have been that. We had the whole world. We had the whole world behind us after 9/11. Even Iran was willing to uh, offer assistance and aid. And what do we end up with? The world looked like uh, at us like one big hillbilly, rope belt and all. Yeah. I don't know about the trials, but um, I, I really don't disagree that we we really did this. We really did. And if any of you get the opportunity, the road to hell uh, in Iraq is worth watching. It's it's a special on uh, CNN, and I, I really recommend you you watch it. A lot of people, I guess, have uh, short memories when it comes to what we do, you know, and or they listen to to people who attempt to justify it and, and, and it's almost, it's, it is unjustifiable. Um, outside the country, you're on the air. Hi. How's it going, Art? It's going well. Yeah, hey, and this is Jack from Australia. I would have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think something that will be very important in the aftermath of this, uh, terrible tragedy will be the uh, foreign policies in Europe. As they are formatted, especially with, um, especially in France, to see how they react to the whole migrant issue and um, immigration and stuff. Well, yeah, I think you're right. We're about to see a reaction. Um, they've closed their borders. That's a pretty radical move for France. And what they're going to do next is going to be an interesting observation. What do you think? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's a pretty big thing for France. They have done that since uh, 1944. Right. So um, stuff is starting to really get real over there. And with more of these attacks, public opinion starts to sway, which, you know, as public opinion changes, it may give politicians more power to do to do action or to get stuff done as well. And this can even be more said for the uh, American government in their uh, inaction, especially mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Like, uh, I believe my own theory is that... Um, Minister Obama, the reason he's not really interfering much in Syria is because he doesn't want the same issue that the uh, Americans had in Somalia back way back when, when um, American bodies were being strewn through the streets. You know, like, you don't want that. It doesn't look good for public image. It doesn't or, look good, uh, yeah. Image. It doesn't look good, but you know uh, there are some wars worth fighting, and um, this is one of them. I mean, this is a group devoted to the extinction of mankind. Ultimately, that's what they want, is Armageddon. And they are going to keep coming and keep growing and keep coming until we deal with them. And I guess uh, sooner is better than later? Yeah. <clears throat> the thing is, with ISIL and this whole Islam problem, you can't criminalize a whole race. You can't be like, uh, all of Islam is bad. That's a problem. Because you know, it's not. I, I, I did, no, nobody, no, not. No, nobody is saying, nobody of any intellectual prowess at all is saying that because it's just untrue. But these people who have decided they want to bring about Armageddon, the end of the world, and they're going to kill everybody who refuses to convert, and they pretty much decided we're not going to convert, and they're right. So they just want to kill us, and if that's the case, then we must go and kill them. Yeah, but, yeah. Again, it's even if America got boots on the ground in uh, in the Middle East, it would, I'd feel it's sort of the same issue that um, America had when in Afghanistan, like identifying targets, like who is the enemy, who is civilian, mm -hmm. and, you know, war crimes. It, it becomes very blurred lines. I, I'm quite perplexed on how to combat this, and I'm sure many top generals and world leaders are perplexed as well. It's hard to erase an ideology from the face of the earth. Well, you know, uh, until uh, some political person gives instructions to the generals, nothing at all will happen. Yeah, uh, it will take some pretty big, um, pretty big moves from some major powers for much to change in that region of the world, yes, sadly. Which, um, I got, I've got to run. Somebody earlier said that um, history has a way of having 
the the right guys step up at the right time. Actually, I think that it was uh, a John Batchelor in the earlier interview, and he's right about that. But boy, it's going to be a close, very close call. Burlington, Vermont. Am I right? Yes. Hi. Hi, Art. It's uh, Laura. I've been listening to you since 1985. Long time. A long time. And when you went off the air, I missed you dearly. And I had to listen oh. to the other show, and it, it just was never the same. And I'm so glad you're back. Thank you. So glad. Thank you. And I wanted to say one thing. What I really miss about your old show is, do you remember when you give everybody the honors at the end to say good night? Yes, I've begun that again. Have you? I haven't heard that. I yeah, have. Really? If, if it was a little bit later, um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Yeah. I, I'm going to put you on hold, and okay. I, I'll come back to you at the end of the show. And what you want to say is good night, world. Oh, I can't say good night, America. Well, you can, but, <laughs> but it's the entire world that's hearing you. So, you know, I mean, we don't want to not greet the appropriate people. Oh, no problem. I'll do that. Can you say good night, world? I can say good night, world. Or you could say good night, America and the world. I'd be that good with that. Better. All right, I'm putting you on hold. Thank you very much. Um, I think Chicago, you're on. Hi. Going once, going twice, gone. Spokane, Washington. Hi. Hello. Going once, twice, gone. Mill Valley, California. Your turn. Hello. Hello. Uh, you know, I think we're missing the whole thing here. We've all touched on it. The whole reason, and I listened to you on the Internet, the whole reason that people listen to your show and shows like it is because there's a bigger picture. If, if even some of the conspiracies, even if, if even some of the, quote, extraterrestrials that are visiting us are true, then isn't it interesting that at a time when we're really pushing disclosure, Stephen Bassett and his group, Dr. Greer and all, that all of a sudden now this point person, this point group, ISIS, that we created, I agree with everything you said, and we shouldn't have gone into Iraq and all the political stuff, but isn't it interesting that if there is a breakaway society, as we hear on your program, if there is a secret space program, mm -hmm. if there are underground bases all around the world, yes. what a perfect way to divert our attention. And what a perfect way, as you say, for people to take away guns. Not that I'm a violent person, but I would feel a lot more comfortable if my community would allow me to have a concealed carry so I could defend myself if some idiot went off in a restaurant or mm -hmm. a theater. Right. You're in California, right? Well, I don't like to say, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, California is indeed a difficult uh, state in which to obtain a carry permit. Uh, it almost takes an act of the California legislature or the governor. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, there there was a time in a couple of the cities where uh, the police chief was denying them, even if you have a perfect record of never been arrested. Right. And you say, well, the sheriff has the right. The sheriff is the higher authority. And then I went and talked to a sheriff once, and he said, oh, I'm not going to give any permits. No, out. I know. It's political. Yeah, look, the whole thing is idiotic. Um, if you look around, uh, indeed, in places where they restrict guns, they have a lot of gun violence. In places where a lot of people carry guns, well, not so much. Well, getting back, and that's true, and getting back but, to but, the But issue, wait, one more thing. Even more important than any of that is the record of people who, are, who have received instruction and received carry permits is, is very, very exemplary. Yeah, from what I've heard, yes. Oh, no, it's true. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I'm just saying, back to the original issue, whether it's defending ourselves, which I would rather do, it becomes more of everything that we've talked about. That's where it is political. Or the Bill of Rights was thrown out after 9-11. The military budget, or uh, the $37 trillion that Cheney said was missing a week before 9-11, that got thrown out because of 9-11. And that's how the black budgets, if we listen to people on your program, are funded. And that's how we have weapons and technology that could throw oil down the toilet and we could all have free energy devices. I sure hope you're right. Well, if we believe in idiots, I don't know if I'm right, you know, but I've met Travis Walton personally a couple of times. I don't think he's lying. You know, I've met Whitley Strieber personally. Well, I know, I but, but Travis Walton doesn't say we've got free energy. Travis Walton got taken up in a, in a saucer. 
Well, then what made the saucer fly is the point. Well, it, but Travis Walton doesn't know. That's he the point. doesn't know. But no. the point is we all can surmise that if there are other civilizations visiting us, if we're being lied to and covered up by, quote, a breakaway society who keeps the technology, who keeps the knowledge who, of, of the fact that there are others visiting us secret, then that's the type of person that could create a group who funds these groups. At least Al Qaeda, we had, uh, you know, Bin Laden was rich, and they were rich Arabs, you know, and it was oil. So it all ties together. So if ISIS is created by us, who's funding them? Are there that many rich guys in the 1% that want to spend money on this? No, I think it's a diversion. Well, a uh, they were funded diversion. to a large degree by an awful lot of the stuff we left in Iraq, I hate to say that, but uh, they hit one bank, I believe, when they, when the Iraqi soldiers took off and ran away. They hit one bank for, what was it, a uh, half billion dollars, something like that? Just astronomical. All right, we don't have a lot of time left. It's too bad because we could go and go and go and go with just hours and hours and hours. But it's about to end, so I'll take a few very fast calls. If you can make a very fast comment, uh, Coos Bay, Oregon, very quick. Uh, my comment is, the problem we have with this country starts at the top. The President of the United States is not doing what he should be doing. Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, Hayes, Kansas, very quickly. All right, this is Tim. I just want to say, uh, Kansas just released uh, constitutional concealed carry, and we have jobs, so come on to Kansas. Way to go, sir. Beverly Hills, California, quickly. Well, this is the ghost of Ronald Reagan again. <laughs> uh, Mendy had me call. He's listening to your show, and he's a friend of mine. And I think either tr Donald Trump, Ben Carson, or Ted Cruz could give these ISIS people a run for their money. You know, this is what happens when too many radical Muslims, the radical ones, just don't have cable television. <laughs> All right, I could go on and on. Every line is full, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go to a really nice lady in Burlington, Vermont, who is now going to say what? Good night, America. Peace out, world. All right, that's the way to do it. Uh, thank you very much, and good night. Good night, all. Four hours, weekends. Why not just strap me to the chair? Good night, everybody. And there's wisdom in the air I've been looking for the answer